John Gow was an infamous pirate who, for a year or so, terrorised the high seas around Europe. Now today we're going to be talking about him and what he got up to, and we're going to be doing it in a more unscripted fashion while reading through my article. So let's get started. John Gow was an infamous pirate who briefly terrorised the seas of Western Europe. The Scotsman launched a successful mutiny and set to destroying and looting ships around the Iberian Peninsula. However, within a year, this brutal pirate captain, aged only 26 in 1725, would hang at the gallows. But given this short career, this, um, his, his campaign of piracy only lasted about a year, but despite this, his, his story has survived the ages. So here we're going to delve into the fascinating story of John Gow. So, John Gow was a Scotsman born in 1698 in Wick in Caithness, which is the Orkneys basically. And he was raised near the Orkneys, sorry. He was raised in Stormness in the Orkney Islands. He's understood to have been born to a William Gow, a merchant and Margaret Calder. Growing up on the coast and islands, he would learn all manner of sailing and navigating the seas. But it didn't take long for John to realise his piracy dreams. His first attempt to seize a ship and to become a pirate had failed. Now we don't know much about his actual childhood, but so we're skipping right now to when he was in his, you know, his early twenties. He'd grown up, he'd learned to sail, and lived what we can assume is maybe a respectable life. But you never know. It sounds like he, ha- he was, might have been a bit of a misfit, so it could have got into a bit of um. You could have had some of the telltale signs that you know we 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 look at so closely these days. So John Gow's first attempt to seize a trip, a pirate ship, and become a pirate had failed. This first try came in August of 1724, when he set sail from London to Lisbon and back. During this voyage, he plotted to seize command of the vessel. Unfortunately for John, he did not manage to achieve the sufficient numbers for his mutiny. When back in London, word got out about his plot, unfortunately. So he fled over to Amsterdam. Being a really good sailor, Proficient in maritime affairs, John was appointed the second mate on a new ship. Now this ship was called Caroline, and it was due to set sail from Amsterdam to Santa Cruz over in Tenerife. After spending some time at the Spanish port city, he got involved with a new ship, the George. That was then loaded up. So this was November the 3rd, 1724. And with a fresh cargo, the vessel set off for Genoa in Italy. However, it didn't take long for for something to start going wrong for the for the crew and for the for the captain of the new crew. Some members had began voicing their discontent at the captain, a man called Frenot, must be French. They were accusing him of treating them improperly, and there were complaints about the food. This was in front of his new employers, the merchant, the merchants whose cargo they held. So this naturally was quite embarrassing, as you can imagine. So the captain was annoyed, but tried to remain professional. So the complaints, the nature of the, these complaints that were being raised, um, were then referred to the ship's steward. The captain believed the accusations were designed to humiliate him in front of the merchants. As they set sail, Paranoia grew as the crew members started to disrespect him. The captain became worried there was a conspiracy at work to undermine him. Of course, he ordered his first mate. Although, of course, as such, he ordered his first mate to deposit the... to deposit small arms in his cabin. You know, paranoid. Worried that something might be brewing. But unfortunately for the captain, this was overheard by one of the increasingly mutinous crew. He actually did suspect a conspiracy was at work against him. And he was right. He was right. So John Gow was the second mate. 
and unknown to the captain, he was the he was the ringleader of the mutineers, and he ordered them. And, and actually, it was, it, was, it was John Gow who was ordered to prepare the guns. So, John Gow was certain at this point that the captain knew his cons- that there was a conspiracy afoot. The Newgate Calendar published an account of what then happened. Because now he knew, now the kind of... You know, now that the, the captain knew that something was happening, he was quite... John was quite prepared to launch the mutiny rather than give the captain more time to prepare a defence and maybe rally his loyal crew to him to prevent this or what what crew he believed loyal at least so the Newgate calendar the Newgate calendar was an interesting publication it it basically started as a list a published list of executions and it soon became a, a place for articles and stories about popular criminals in the 17 and 1800s so kind of like magazine about about crime and and criminals of the day so it must be very very fascinating fascinating so um but there's criticisms about the newgate calendar that it was some of the stories were drawn from dubious sources highly embellished um obviously to sensationalize the story make it more interesting very similar to our modern media but it gave a gory description of this mutiny. So, in a series of brutal murders, I'm paraphrasing here, in a series of brutal murders, the, the mutineers slashed the throats of the captain, the surgeon, first mate, and the supercargo as they slept. So, <clears throat> they're all sleeping and then they get attacked by the mutineers, um, basically murdered and thrown overboard. But, um, so there's a captain, sergeant, first mate, and the supercargo. The supercargo, in case you don't know, is, is the representative of the ship's owner on board a merchant ship, responsible for overseeing the cargo and its sale upon the destination. The businessman, basically, is in charge of all that kind of stuff. The surgeon, it is believed, didn't die at first, but flailed around on the floor before perishing. So... Uh, and not a very nice death for him. The supercargo and first mate came up to the quarter deck of the ship, clutching their bleeding necks as well. It was here the fledgling pirates shot them down with pistols. As for the captain, this is a quote directly from the Newgate calendar. Okay, so open quotes. The captain, hearing a noise, demanded the occasion of it. The botswain replied that he did not know but he was apprehensive that some of the men had either fallen or been thrown overboard. The captain hereupon went to look over the ship's side, on which two of the murderers followed, and tried to throw him into the sea, but he disengaged himself and turned about to take a view of them, when one of them cut his throat, but not as so to kill him, for he now solicited mercy. But instead of granting it, the other stabbed him in the back with a dagger. So he's pleading to one of the mutineers and the other one just comes up behind and stabs him in the back. Okay, back to the quote. And would have repeated his blow, but that he had struck with such force that he could not draw back the weapon. At this instant, Gow, who had been assisting in the murders between the decks, came on the quarter deck and fired a brace of balls into the captain's body, which put a period to his life. Close quotes. So there you have it. That's that's kind of the description of the an essence of what this pirate takeover looked like, according to the Newgate calendar anyway. The fact is, Gow and his men orchestrated a mutiny and murdered the captain and his men. The next morning, the rest of his crew was given a choice. They either joined the mutineers or follow the captain. It is understood crew were all happy to join, fearing they would be killed anyway. <laughs> they didn't have much of a choice, basically, so they were press-ganged into this new pirate operation. Now, more on that later. So, successfully taking over the ship, the conspirators divided the valuables, and they spent the evening drinking, leaving the care of the ship to the non-mutineering crew. So... The, the mutineers go and have a party, get drunk, 
celebrate their victory and the rest are left to tend to the tend to the crew tend to the ship so the crew was made up of 24 men four had been murdered and eight were conspirators further four approved of the mutiny that left eight who did not support the coup here's another quote from the newgate calendar Open quote. On the following day, the new captain summoned these eight men to attend him, and telling him that he was determined to go on a cruising voyage, said that they should be well treated if they were disposed to act in concert with the rest of the crew. He said that every man should fare in the same manner, and that good order and discipline were all that would be required. He said he further said that the captain's inhumanity had produced the consequences which had happened. That those who had not been concerned in the conspiracy had no reason to fear any ill consequences from it, and they had only to discharge their duty as seamen, and every man should be rewarded according to his merit. Sounds all right. It's, understand the non, it's understood the non-mutineering Carew at this point made no form of reply. But Gow did interpret, it, interpret this as assent to his new command, that they would not oppose him. So he had a crew, basically, who were willing to follow his orders. A close eye was kept on these men by the pirates. The new pirate captain renamed the ship Revenge. So he's chosen a really, you know, wicked, you know, kind of like a dark name for it. The Revenge, which, or Revenge. Pretty cool name, if you ask me. Fits a pirate operation. Gow and his men now spent weeks terrorising British ships around the Iberian Peninsula. Not long after the mutiny on November 12th, they stuck the... They struck the delight. An English ship. Then on November the 21st, the Sarah. <laughs> the Sarah. <laughs> Imagine calling a ship the Sarah. Maybe, like, it's, it's like... <laughs> I suppose it's, it's it must have been a nice... I mean, when you think of the word named Sarah, you don't initially think of a, you know, a sailing ship. Gow and his pirates would set the crews, would set the crews adrift, but some were offered the chance to join the pirate crew. In the following months, Gow continued to plunder and sink other ships in the region. One such seizure of an English ship bound for Newfoundland, they came across... A kindred spirit. Having seized a ship and stolen its goods, they found a man called James Belvin. Belvin was understood to be cruel by nature and very keen to join the pirate crew. Gow welcomed him in, as he noticed his men tended to act out of fear rather than inclination. So, yeah. so it's it's like management here. Well, my men are actually just um, acting out of fear, but here we've got someone who's a naturally cruel bastard who wouldn't mind murdering and slaughtering and, um, and pirating on the high seas. So bring him on in. Bring him on into the crew. Fine addition to the crew. Belvin was apparently accustomed to the practice of acts of barbarity. This isn't much information, sorry, there isn't much information on how Gow's attacks were orchestrated. The pirates continued sacking ships on the seas. They would take any goods they thought valuable to them, and these goods included men, arms, ammunition, and stores. So they're just basically stealing everything. The other cargo they didn't want would be sunk along with the ship. So this is like serious, serious crime they're committing here really bad. They're sacking several English and trading ships, just stealing stuff. It's sinking the ships, setting the crews adrift in the middle of the sea. Absolutely horrifying, horrifying thing to happen to you. Like really, 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 you know, just a we can't even imagine that happening to us nowadays. But that was the risk that being a sailor was back then in the, in the golden age of piracy at least which wasn't a long period to be fair but it was real it was real it was real think about that next time you're on a ferry or 
or a cruise or on a boat in the sea. A ship in the sea, sorry. Um, so, generally speaking, pirates prefer to get up close and personal when they're intimidating and doing their work. So I, I've drawn here a quote from a really good article by Tracy Wilson on how stuff works. And the, Tracy basically explains how a typical pirate attack might have happened. So quite fascinating because we've got no actual first-hand accounts really of, of what Gao's attacks look like. But we can assume that they would mimic pirate attacks of the day because they were quite, the tactics were quite interesting. So let's, let's, let's read the quote. Open quote, pirates needed to be able to plunder ships before they sank or to keep the ship rather than sinking it. This, in addition to their cannons inherent dangerous, made ship-to-ship -ship battles risky. Pirates instead liked to intimidate their victims into surrendering or, or board the enemy ship and fight hand-to-hand -hand on deck. The ideal pirate attack could go one of two ways. The pirates could approach their target openly run up the Jolly Roger and accept the ship's surrender. Or, this is what I found is quite, quite cool. The pirates could use smaller boats and board the enemy ship using grappling hooks. One of the pirates would disable the ship's rudder to prevent escape. Sorry, no, it's the next tactic. I find cool. Open quotes again. But not every ship surrendered peacefully and not every raid went without a hitch. So pirates used heavy weapons when necessary and could fire or disable to just it could fire weapons to destroy a ship cannons could also fire double cannon balls chain shot which damage or destroy masts and rigging they could also fire grape shot to the sailors when firing at people and generally tried tried to take the sailor on the wheel first actually what i the, the tactic i really liked that i heard about isn't actually in there I think the the tactic I, I read about, which which was quite interesting, was when pirates would just go crazy and try to to use their reputation and really scare the ship into surrendering. So there was no actual, so there was no no need to fight, and the crews would just surrender instantly because they thought, absolutely no way am I fighting these psychopath pirates. Now that's actually a documented technique. I can't remember what exact pirate it was from but that's it's why pirates often cultivated these like demonic reputations so they could scare the ships into surrendering rather than risking you know actual violence and fighting which is fair enough it's a good technique psychological warfare another interesting case is when Gao and his men arrived at port santa a portuguese port he sent his men into the settlement to get supplies and he gave a gracious gift to the governor of Salmon and Herring. They were quite well received and invited the governor over to their boat but they did not, the governor, they didn't bring supplies with them. They hadn't been given any. So what Gao did here, he actually returned, turned on the official and threatened to kill them all unless supplies were delivered. The shocked governor and his friends, dreading being executed, complied with these demands. So they basically went to this port and extorted it um, and threatened to kill the governor, which is a quite a bold and brash move. After several months of terrorizing the Iberian Peninsula, the pirates were getting worried. Concerned that intelligence of their escapades would be picked up on and they'd, you know, they, they would, people would really start to come after them. They decided to go somewhere else. Some in the crew suggested the coast of the coast of Guinea, others North America, and others also to the West Indies. However, Gao proposed that they sail to the Orkney Islands, his homelands, well up in the north of Scotland. Having had their fill of loot, Gao persuaded the crew they could retire peacefully there. He is said to have persuaded them by warning them of the dangers of travelling to unknown places with so little provision and that they needed to repair the ship. Plus, he reckoned no one would think to look for them in the Scottish Isles. You know what? Pretty good idea, to be honest. You would think. 
Like, who is going to look for him all the way on the tip of Scotland in what was probably a considerable backwater? In early 1925, the pirate captain assumed the name John Smith. He and his crew sailed back into Orkney, having renamed his ship the George. Back to the George now. <laughs> With all their loot, he presented himself as a wealthy merchant. Rich and successful, he found himself a girlfriend, a Miss Gordon. Unfortunately for Gow, he was recognised by a merchant. His true identity, and that of his crew, were revealed. But it's also said one of the forced crew members had actually escaped and notified the authorities, which to be honest sounds like sounds like a quite a quite a realistic thing to happen. Acting what is considered incredibly careless, Gow did not immediately head to sea. He and his pirates raided the remote mansion hall of the Clestrain on the Orkneys on February the 10th, 1725. Later, they tried to attack another on Calf Sound. It had belonged to a Mr. Fee, an old school friend of Gow. But unfortunately for Gow, the ship ran aground and due to the difficult navigation of the area, the Orkney Islands is like quite a lot of islands, maybe about 12 or so. It's, it's, it's quite a lot and they're all, they're all quite close together. But it's a it's a kind of cluster of islands. Some are really quite small as well. So you can you can imagine it might be quite easy to to run aground if you're not a real a real pro there, or it might just be easy, easy to make a mistake. So the ship ran aground, and word was sent to Mister Fee for help. They wanted him to help them tug them back into the sea. But Guy was given quite an evasive answer, and Mister Fee, in the meantime destroyed his own boats so the pirates could not make use of it because he didn't he did not want to help these people word might have got out about what was actually happening well i believe it had actually mr fee and his men ended up seizing the pirates who had come ashore ultimately the rest were tricked into coming ashore and some 28 were all seized and not one shot had been fired no violence at all eventually um, John Gow would also be seized. He he was the last one, I believe, or one of the last. Mr. Fee sent word to Edinburgh and then to London of his new prisoners. They were taken to the Tower of London and then to Marshalsea Prison. The Marshalsea, which was operate, operated from 1373 to 1842, was a notorious institution and held men for crimes at sea, seditionists, and debtors. Gow is understood to have been very quiet and miserable while in the Southwark jail. He did not plea at his trial, and as because he didn't make a plea, he just refused, he was sentenced to be pressed to death. Now this is one of the most horrific ways of dying I can ever imagine. So basically this was a particular sentence that was reserved for for criminals who refused to actually make a plea. It dates back to the to the 1200s and being pressed to death commonly involved a board being set upon the body. The hands and legs were strapped down to the sides so you imagine you're lying down on another board. You're strapped down maybe in a star shape or on a kind of cross shape, a T sort of shape. And then, a, then a board would be placed on top of you. Then a jailer would pile rocks on top of it. As the weight piled up, the victim would not only begin to suffocate, but their bones were also crushed and broken. Sometimes their bones would even splinter and burst through their skin. At any point, it is said, they could end their torture by pleading guilty or not guilty. Now, this particularly horrible form of punishment sometimes could last for days so think of how horrific that would be being stuffed under a board with rocks being piled up on top of it and you're just being crushed crushed to death slowly this is what john gowden Gow was facing so he actually changed his mind he decided to plead and he was taken to court he was convicted like the rest of his crew 
Gao and six of his crew members were executed together. It is said that when Gao was hanging, he flailed in torment so much that his crew tried to pull his legs to help his misery. To help his misery, you know, to end, help end this misery. So you're pulling him down, trying to be like, let's hurry up and kill him. This is unfair, <clears throat> too barbaric to watch. However, the rope to the gibbet ended up snapping. So he had to be hanged again. So that is an absolutely nightmarish end. Eventually dead, all of these pirates were hanged in chains on the banks of the Thames in London. What a horrible way to go. But you know, he was only 26 at the time. Lived fast, died young, took some crazy risks, had a crazy year just going about being a pirate, sacking ships, destroying things, murdering people, stealing, looting, sinking ships, you know, it's marooning people in the middle of the ocean. He truly a, quite a villainous, quite a villainous thing to be up to. It's, but it's amazing how, despite the horrors of people like John Gow, and how truly despicable the acts they... <laughs> The acts he carried out, they, they are very much romanticised in this day and age. We love pirate stuff. There's a huge fascination about pirates. There's something really interesting and, 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 and you know, not warming, but something exciting about just taking to the high seas and pillaging and living free. I imagine it would have been pretty horrific to actually be in that situation because I've read some accounts of living and working in a in a ship in the 1700s and it's cramped you're constantly wet or you're constantly you're constantly too hot you're too cold you're wet you're hungry you're confined to a very small space the bel below decking the below decks aren't big quite small you can't stand up you're working you know 12 hour shifts basically Sometimes you don't get paid, sometimes you don't eat, as I said, sometimes you don't drink. So to top that off with just going about destroying and sacking and looting, pillaging, it is a crazy life. That's maybe why it's so, people are so interested about it nowadays, because just to even imagine doing that, European peoples out on the waters, on these crazy adventures of unadulterated crime at its highest level disrupting people it's always innocent people who end up being killed by them to know that that existed just a few hundred years ago pretty crazy pretty crazy the golden age of piracy did come to an end though i think once they because the pi many of the pirates especially in the caribbean as we kind of always hear about where we're all, where we, we know most about what happened then because but it did exist around Europe too, just like John Gow. But the pirates over in the Caribbean, they were often working at the discretion of their kings. So the English or British sailors would be privateers, sometimes they could be called, would be working on, with the, the crown's permission to destroy Spanish ships and steal their stuff and sell it back to, to England or just um, bring it back to England and they'd be rewarded for their work but often they would actually just start attacking english ships as well so <laughs> you couldn't trust these people you couldn't trust them at all they're just absolute like true scallywags and i'm pretty sure that must be that's a that's a nautical word for that kind of thing but yeah that was the story of john gow and john gow it's a tragic story really i mean you're, you're 25 years old you 26 and you and you go out and you just start going crazy on the ocean and then you eventually hang for it and you you have a brutal horrible death being strangled and then your and your friends try to help me help make it easier on you and and they just make it worse oh what a life what a life makes you think <laughs>